timeline of yoga. The earliest, the earliest texts uh, were, the, were, were, the, were the Vedic text, texts. And there's a great deal of um, discussion about how old they actually are. And it's really not that important. The traditionalists, the Indian traditionalists, the teachers, um, give them, make them much earlier than the Western scholars. And this is very typical of ages in, in India. The Indians believe that the older something is, the more authority it has. So when an Indian gives an age of a, of a, of a, tr a traditional text, it's considerably older than the age given to it by the scholars who look at other things to determine how old the text is. It's some of its grammar, this language, its references, things like that. They used to date it. So the earliest texts in, in India are, the, are the, the, four, the four Vedic Samhitas, the four collections, the Rig, the Yajur, the Sama, and the Atarva Vedas. And the oldest one of those and the most important of the four are the, uh, is the Rig Veda. Rig Veda, the knowledge of praise. Um, this text and the, the text that accompanied it, the Yajur and the Sama Vedas, were used in Vedic rituals from about 1700 BCE or, or, or BC on. And initially, the, the, the rituals were fairly simple. There were, there were four priests, one for each of the, the four Vedas. Um, and over time, however, the rituals became more and more elaborate and, as a consequence, more and more costly. Um, also, they became more and more mechanical, I guess, is the right word to use. And uh, this created a, a disturbance among some of the, some of the, some of the uh, Brahmin uh, priests and Brahmin caste who felt that the, that, the, that the ritual itself had lost its meaning. And this encouraged them to look in other places for, they, they asked new questions about themselves. And um, the questions they started asking led to the discovery of the self, the, of the soul. And this, this was at first, um, this was at first recorded in, in, a, in, a, in a number of books called the Aranyakas, which means the forest books. And there's a little bit of controversy about why these books are called that. Some people say they're written in the forest by hermits and ascetics, so that's why they're called the forest books. Other people say they were only taught in the forest because the information that was in the books was so dangerous to the culture and the Brahmins. The Brahmins, of course, had a great stake in the, in the lucrative uh, business of, of the rituals, and they were very protective of it. Uh, they were protective of, of the rituals themselves. And of the Sanskrit language, by the way, there's a dark side to Sanskrit that's not usually brought out. Um, it was, it was, it was, there were, there were, there were very terrible punishments to uh, outcast people who might have heard uh, the, 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 the Sanskrit being recited. Uh, we won't go into it you know, right now because it's a little bit, a little bit um, gory. Um, but um, so these, uh, these, these men, uh, and they were usually men, uh, went out either into the forests or in, in secluded areas and started asking questions about the self. And, and these, these questions came to, uh, um, they, 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 began to, they began to bear fruit, the answers began to come to them. Um, but we don't really have much to say about the Rig Veda because although there's a controversy about whether there's any, any yoga in the Rig, most Western scholars really don't believe that there is. Where the yoga starts to come in is in the Upanishads, which, is, which are much later development that, that, grow, that grow out of uh, the, the original texts. And the Upanishads are um, dated usually between maybe 800 BCE and 400, 300 BCE. It's, it, again, it's, 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 a, it's a controversy. The, the text that's most important for, for yoga students is, is the Kata Upanishad, K-A-T-H-A, Kata because in it is the first concrete reference to a yoga practice. It's called Adiyatma Yoga, which means the yoga of the inner self. Now, if you ask an, uh, anybody, usually a teacher or a student, how old yoga is, they'll say, I don't, I don't know where this number comes from, but um, they'll say 5,000 years, and, and, and that, that's not. I mean, there might be practices that go back to 3,000 BC, but, um, as far as that's concerned, there, 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 there's, nothing, there's nothing that we're doing today that, that, that they're doing in 3,000. Our, our, our practice is considerably different than, um, 
than what was going on in 3000 BC. So, I mean, Western yoga is probably about 100 years old, tops. Um, so, however, the first concrete reference to a yoga practice is made in the Katha Upanishad, and that usually dated around four or 500 BC. E. So, um, the oldest text, the, the, the oldest surviving text that makes a reference to, to yoga would be the, the Katha Upanishad. And there's two things in there that are very important. The first one is a is a dialogue between a, 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 a sassy young man by the name of Nachiketas, whose name means I don't know, and the, the, the deity, the god of the underlord, uh, underworld, whose name is Yama, which means the, the restrainer, Yama, the hold back. And uh, Nachiketas is literally condemned to hell by his father, who, who he, Nachiketas was being given a hard time. His father said, you know, just go to hell, which being a Brahmin, uh, the word had, had to be, he had to, he had to follow the word of his father. So off he went to hell, but when he got there, Brahma wasn't home, and he had to sit outside the house for three days, which was a terrible affront to a Brahmin. So even the god of death was afraid of a Brahmin's curse. So he gave Nachiketas three, three, three wishes. The first one was, of course, to get back into his father's good graces. The second one was to know the meaning of the sacrificial fire. And the third one, uh, and of course, uh, Yama gave him the first two without any argument. But the third one was, what happens after death? And Yama, you know, well, who knows? It's just, it's just, I, I, wouldn't you rather have like a hundred cows or how about, some, how about some land? How about a nice estate? Or how about, you know, how about anything you really want other than, have, other than that? And Nachiketas was adamant and he said, no, no, it's, all that stuff is, is ephemeral. What I want is the knowledge of what happens after death. And there's a couple of speculations about why Yama was so reluctant to give him the word. Uh, basically, I think the real answer is that he was testing him to see if he was really serious about wanting to know the answer to the question. And so Yama then began the teaching about, um, about what happens after, to the soul after death or to the body after death. And what comes out then is, is as I said, the first concrete reference, or the first co surviving concrete reference to yoga, which was called the yoga of the inner self. And uh, essentially, it's, it's a, it, Yama says to sit down, as far as the practice is concerned, to sit down and meditate on, on, the, on the self. Um, the other important aspect of the, uh, the other important um, scene or uh, image in the Katha Upanishad is the famous story about the chariot, which um, is, is, a, is a symbol of, of, of yoga practice itself. And the chariot in this, in this little parable represents the human body. The, um, the charioteer represents the higher mind and the, and the reins, the lower mind, and the, uh, the horses are the senses. And the rider in the chariot is, is the self, is the Atman. And um, the image is that the, um, if the higher mind isn't, isn't organized, isn't, doesn't have any understanding, then it has no way to control the senses through the, through the lower mind, and the horses run crazy, and um, there's no chance then for, for an enlightenment. And, and what, what happens then is they're stuck on, you're stuck on the wheel of, of birth, death, and rebirth. The next really um, essential um, text after that, as, as far as yoga students are concerned, is the, is the Yoga Sutra. Now I'm saying, usually you hear, the, you, you hear it pronounced Yoga Sutras. Um, that is okay to say that, but technically speaking, a sutra is the individual, uh, uh, individual uh, uh, aphorism and the, the collection of aphorisms as well. So a sutra is both an individual uh, verse and a collection of ver verses. And the Yoga Sutra is usually dated around 300 uh, CE or AD. And the reason why that's historically important is that um, it's the first present, uh, systematic presentation of a yoga practice. And of course, the most famous aspect of that are the, are the, eight, are the eight limbs, the, the Ashtanga Yoga. Um, and, um, but as, as, far as, philosoph um, as far as practically and philosophically, the Yoga Sutras are not, not terribly uh, important uh, uh, as far as the history of yoga is concerned. Historically, it's an important document because it had, a, it had an influence on subsequent schools as far as the, the number of um, 
the, the number of limbs they had in the school, usually about eight. But um, as far as philosophically and practically, it really didn't have much of an impact uh, on, on, on a subsequent yoga. Um, the next really important text after that is, is called the Hatha. It's usually called the Hatha Yoga Pradipika in popular language and popular literature, but technically speaking, the, the, the proper title is the Hatha Pradipika. And that one is usually dated sometime in the mid-15th century, about 1450. And this is a text, it's, 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 what, it's what's called a watershed, because it, 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 there's a number of really important firsts in this text that, you, that, that, that are very important for, for yoga students to know about. But this is really the first text that sets out to teach Hatha Yoga. Um, and it, 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 it's also the first text that includes asanas that are, that are, that are non-seated asanas. This is, this is something that's brand new. For the first 500 years of, of uh, yoga's history, between about 900 and about 1450, asana retained its original meaning, which is seat or sitting. And there were, no, there, there were no other kinds of asanas but sitting asanas described in the, in the, in the, in the texts that were, that were associated with Hatha Yoga, early Hatha Yoga. So the Pradipika was very important because, as I say, um, it was the first text that presented asanas that were, asanas that were, that were not sitting poses and that were pr primarily done to, to promote health. So the other thing that's very important about this text, it, it's the beginning of the idea that yoga can be a therapeutic practice and the asanas were used for that purpose. Um, um, and for, after the Hatha Pradipika, you usually see, you, what you see is this gradual proliferation of, of yoga asanas uh, throughout the, the succeeding uh, centuries um, until you get li like the light on yoga in, in, in modern times where there's 200 asanas in, in, in the text. And the next, the next really important thing that modern students need to know about is, 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 is the modern revolution in yoga, which, which begins around the beginning of the, of the 20th century. And, uh, you know, that uh, Krishnamacharya, uh, Tirumila Krishnamacharya, Krishnamacharya played a big role in that. And, of course, that was disseminated to the West by his students, Iyengar, Tessikachar, and Patavi Joyce. And, uh, a, a fourth student who's often left out, which is unfortunate, uh, Indra Devi, who had, who had a very interesting life and uh, did, did a lot to bring yoga to the West.